God of all mercy, giver of all grace. It is the great I am in which we gather this morning to worship. Our hearts awaken to the call of repentance, believing that your loving kindness and mercy await us. Each time we confess, our minds and spirits cleansed, believing in your abundant grace. May our lives reflect your steadfast nature, loving, kind, gracious, merciful, because you and you alone are worthy to be praised. the Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to worship with Wilshire Baptist Church. Whether you are a long-term member or a first-time guest, 
Worshiping with your family or alone, nearby or far away, you are an important part of our corporate worship together, even virtually. If you are a guest among us, we would love to get to know you better, and we would love to share more about us with you. You can do that by emailing pastor at wilshirebc.org. You can also use that email to share any prayer request that you'd like for us to be praying for. If you're like me, you're anxious to start meeting together again in person, and I have good news for you. Starting next Sunday, March 28th, which is Palm Sunday, we invite you to join us for a worship service in the parking lot outside at 8 a.m. or 11 a.m. You can go to our website to register so that we know how to prepare. We will also have reserve spots um, for cars if you prefer to stay in your vehicle. While you're there, go ahead and register for one of our three Sunday morning worship services on Easter Sunday and take a look at all the other opportunities available to you. Now, may we continue in worship. on the Enneagram, which a big thing for eights is that we both like to be in control and we have a huge fear of being controlled. So in this last year or so of life, I've learned that I really don't have any control over what's happening in the world around me or even what's happening in my own life. Um, and so, especially as I'm moving into this next phase of life, I don't know where I'm going to be living or working when my residency ends in, I guess, four months or so. And I have no control over any of that. And that's really terrifying for me. But in the midst of this desire for control kind of dying within me, what's coming to life in me is that I'm learning to trust and actively trying to trust that God's got me. My grandmother always told me that God's got me and that God will never steer me wrong. And so as I'm moving into this unknown of my life, I have to trust that the God whose steadfast love has always endured and the God who has always walked with me will continue to do so. What is dying in me? is the illusion, the lie, that I have to do any of this alone. Life, struggles, pain, um, the sense that I have to do it alone and bear the weight alone is dying so quickly in me, which is weird because it has been a year of isolation but God is raising to life a sense of a new community. Hope to see your faces soon and hug you. Um, a new sisterhood of colleagues, connection to alumni. God is raising to life a sense of belonging in me. And I'm so grateful for that. Well, there's something that's been dying a very slow death inside of me for a while. And the pandemic in this season of life has effectively killed it. Uh, and that is the, the desire to please people. I have found in this season, I, I no longer want to please people. I'm done. That part of me is gone. Instead, I have found a deep desire to instead know people. I want to connect with people. I want to know who they are. I want to know what they love. I want to know what makes people laugh and cry. I want to know how I can help, how I can be in community with people. My 
people pleasing, of course, I think started in school and some of us never lost that need to get straight A's. It was dying in me for a long time and it is effectively dead now. And now I'm ready, more than ready, to get to know Wilshire, to get to know this beautiful community of people and to really, really be a part of you all and to get to know you as family. What is dying in me is the sense that I can do everything on my own, <laughs> that I could even try to do things on my own. We're meant for village life, for community life, for deep um, interrelatedness and interconnectedness, interdependence. I'm dying to any notion that says otherwise. And what I think God is bringing to life in me is a willingness and a deep desire to be a part of this, to be a part of shared life together, to stop doing it on our own individually. A reading from the book of Psalms. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner, when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God and put a new and right spirit within. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? Have mercy on us, O God. Have mercy on us. Once again, we beg for mercy in the face of overwhelming sin. We can feel the weight of it in our bones. We feel the shame of it in our faces. We feel the lie of it in our inward beings. Once again, oh God, how many times will we say once again? Once again, we plead for an end to this violence which plagues us. Eight people are dead in Atlanta, shot to death by a man twisted up in toxic theologies, racist attitudes, and the sin of hatred. Forgive us, O oh God, for the role our society has played in all of this. Forgive us, our national leaders who use racist tropes to prey on fear and gain more power. Forgive us our disordered sexual desires which reduce your beloved children to objects that we use and then discard. Forgive us for blaming victims and justifying the horrors of murder to lessen the discomfort we have with our own prejudiced hearts. Have mercy on us. Make us new. Take away our bent to sinning and help us dismantle the sin baked into our human institutions. Give us the power and the courage to exercise these demons and to confront these sins within ourselves. Illuminate what we so often hide, that we may confess, and we may be forgiven, and we may be empowered, sure of the promise of redemption offered to us by your Son. Have mercy on us. Let those mercies extend also to those in this congregation for whom we pray. 
to Jan, grant the mercy of healing. To Michael, Avon, Perry, and David, grant the mercy of a swift recovery. And to Bob, grant the mercy of your unending comfort, even in his final days. Have mercy on these and all who weigh heavy on our hearts in this hour. Have mercy on us, O God. As the Lenten season comes near to an end, let what is sinful in us die, that we may be filled with life through your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. reading from the Gospel of John. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said, that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, after a year and a week or something like that of sheltering in place amidst fear, something like 500,000, somewhere over 500,000 deaths, an untold injury due to the coronavirus. The notion of dying to live is not a metaphor. We feel in our bones a deep affliction, a deep desire to reach out and touch life, real life, real meaning and real goodness. We are done with deceptions and preoccupations. We are tired of reruns and preoccupations that keep us checked out of our lives. We want to live. We are dying to live. And so we come to worship over YouTube. <laughs> Because if we're honest with ourselves, there's, there's something to this thing. Not YouTube, per se, but worship. For over a year, we've made do with pre-recorded services, done very well, by the way. Thank you to everyone in the back. We've, but we've made do with pre-recorded worship services and Facebook events and Zoomed everything and maybe perhaps a few unofficial moments of praise by ourselves in our homes because there's something to this act of worship. There's something to it. That's because the worship of the living God is not something of obscure irrelevance. It is not a relic <laughs> or a performance empty of significance. It is an act of glory, of lifting, of raising high the name of God. In the process, it is also divine transformation, a lifting and a glorification of us into the likeness of God's Son, Jesus the Christ. But what does it mean to glorify God? <laughs> what does this divine transformation even look like? What does it mean for us to be lifted and glorified into the likeness of Christ? The good news is, is we're not alone in these wonderings. In our gospel reading today, we hear that even Jesus felt troubled about the ramifications of giving glory to God. Worship, as it turns out, is an honest act, but it is no simple thing. Worship costs us everything. Speaking of cost, a few weeks ago, my co-residents and I were sitting around on Resident Road talking about tithing, like you do. This is not a stewardship sermon, I promise. Don't freak out. <laughs> well, this is going to embarrass the Reverend Ashley Robinson very, very much. Um, but what came out of that conversation about money and what to do with it was one of the most beautiful explications of worship that I'd ever heard. I'm not going to be able to say it word for word, but Ashley said, we bring our tithes and offerings to God not because we owe it to God or because God needs it back. We bring our currency to God as an act of worship, of aligning ourselves to God, of aligning our beings with God's being. And she mentioned open hands, giving with open hands. She said, letting go of our own expectations of what our money can do in our own hands is an act of worship. Likewise, giving songs, prayers, dances, and words openly and in community with open hands Letting go and letting them thrive in the world is, in a sense, letting our individual expectations die so that something else might live. Through the act of worship, we direct all of our energies in every way toward God, allowing God to direct and transform our lives. 
to save us from the deceitfulness of sin, to wake us up to real life, to make our living and our dying mean something. We bring what we are to God in celebration, gratitude, and awe. And in doing so, our very selves are lifted and attuned to God's way and truth. In worship, we lay ourselves down and are lifted to life. That's right, though. All that happened sitting around a campfire on resident row. Y'all, the spirit is alive and at work in the Wilshire residency program. (laughs) Praise be to God. And thank you. It's beautiful what Ashley said about worship. That in worship, we both surrender ourselves to God and receive ourselves anew. We die in a sense and we rise. On a personal level, this is astounding. It's no wonder that we keep coming back and repeating the process, going farther up and deeper into grace. But in our gospel text today, we see that this is not just for us. Worship is not just a personal act of devotion. A group of Greek outsiders want to see Jesus. They'd come to town to worship, already starting to trust God in their hearts. Sir, we would see Jesus, they said. In response, Jesus reveals to his disciples that it is time for the truth to be revealed to everyone, not just their small religious group in the Galilee. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be lifted up and glorified, which we we know alludes to his coming death on a cross and to his resurrection to eternal life that will be for all people. There is something that both attracts and repels in the stories and metaphors that Jesus uses, though. Let's just be honest. Unless a seed dies, it cannot bear fruit. Yes, we get that one. Uh, That makes sense. But what about the seed? Do we think the seed likes the idea of transforming into something else? Fruit sounds great, but the process sounds iffy. And what is this about losing our lives? That's what's got Jesus troubled about worship and giving glory to God. He doesn't want to die. He doesn't want to die. My heart is troubled, he says. What should I say? Father, save me from this hour. Jesus doesn't want to face the final transformation, but he trusts his Father. This will not be in vain. He seems to know it for sure. The death, this death, his death, will mean something for everyone. So, all of this gets tied up in the matter of worship, of dying to self and being lifted to life eternal. Worship is an act of trust. (laughs) that the transformation waiting on the other side is worth it. Worship is an act of trust that God is good. I don't want to undersell how terrifying this act of trust can be, beloved. When Jesus is lifted up on the cross, we are, we are both attracted and repelled. In the act of worship, we see the truth of life. There are no more lies or deceptions, no more amusing anecdotes or fluff stories. In worship, there is only what is real about us and what is real about God. 
both the wonder of our being together (laughs) and the horrors, too, of what we can do. Simone Weil was a French philosopher, mystic, and activist who lived and died in the early 20th century. She was born to an affluent family who who loved her and believed in her. And from that foundation of love and support, Simone went boldly into the world and made herself acquainted with the horrors of what humanity could do. She forsook comforts in order to stand in solidarity with the working poor in factories, and she organized against regimes of individualism and consumerism and Nazism. She wrote and connected ideas and people with the realities of life that no one wanted to see. For years, she fasted, feeling it immoral to eat more than her poorest neighbors. Simone ultimately died a seemingly senseless death because of malnourishment and fatigue. Her story is a story that both attracts and repels. And honestly, there's enough in her theology and philosophy to do the same thing, attract and repel, but that's what makes it sound so awfully familiar, really. On the process of what we call worship, Simone wrote this. The beauty of the world is the mouth of a labyrinth. The unwary individual who on entering takes a few steps is soon unable to find the opening. Worn out with nothing to eat or drink in the dark, separated from his dear ones and from everything he loves and is accustomed to, he walks on without knowing anything or hoping anything, incapable even of discovering whether he's really going forward or merely turning around on the same spot. But this affliction is as nothing compared with the danger threatening him. For if he does not lose courage, If he goes on walking, it is absolutely certain that he will finally arrive at the center of the labyrinth. And there, God is waiting to eat him. Later, he will go out again and he will be changed. He will have become different after being eaten and digested by God. Afterward, He'll stay near the entrance so that he can gently push all those who come near into the opening. In worship, we dare the labyrinthian inner courts of our hearts so that we may be transformed by the God waiting to know us. And to be known by God is to be made different as terrifying as that may seem. Can we trust this God? The one who both attracts and repels. The one who comforts and terrifies. The one who asks we die to live. Shall we trust this love? On her hardest days, Simone Weil was often known to recite George Herbert's 17th century poem, Love Three, quietly to herself. It goes like this. Love bade me welcome, yet my soul drew back guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love, observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest, I answered, worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, ungrateful, ah, my dear, I cannot look on thee. And love took my hand and smiling did reply, 
Who made the eyes but I? Truth, Lord, but I have marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not, says love, who bore the blame? My dear, then I will serve. You must sit down, says love, and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat. Worship is daring and costly. But love does not leave us hungry. No. At the heart of Jesus' invitation to come and die is his promise of life eternal. And that doesn't begin, beloveds, only in our mortal passing to be present to God, to give our attention to God, to align our gifts and energies to God, to worship is to touch the eternal now. It's to dare too, to touch the thing that scares us the most. In worship, we remember Jesus' final transformation, his body lifted high on a cross, a display of the very, very worst we could do. And in worship, we are touched by the love that did not forsake him even then. Let us take the risk, dear ones. Let us take the risk and draw near to the one who is already drawing near to us. And may our transformation mean grace for the world. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today, Wilshire and friends. Um, praise be to God for the love that lifts us and transforms us, the love that comes to us no matter what. If today you feel a stirring within yourself and you want to talk to someone about that, um, you can email us at pastor at wilshirebc.org. One of the ministers on staff will get back with you, and we'd love to just come alongside and, and hear your story. Um, as you relate to God. Um, Y'all, it's been a really hard thing to be separate, but the the love of God is what keeps us together. So uh, this week, I encourage you, reach out to us if you wanna talk, but also reach out to one another. Tell someone a story this week of how love has lifted you. I think that could be pretty cool. Um, I'm going to give us a benediction now. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into these doors. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>